Okay, so this is chapter 8, and chapter 8 begins on page 242. The appendicular skeleton. The bones of the appendicular skeleton are primarily involved in body movements. As appendages to the central skeleton, these bones include those of the upper and lower limbs, including the girdles that attach them to the axial skeleton. So the pectoral girdle, or the shoulder girdle, the two pectoral shoulder girdles include a clavicle and a scapula. And if we look here on figure 8.1, page 243, we can see the clavicle was also commonly known as the collarbone. And then the scapula, you see here, this is the posterior view of the pectoral girdle. The scapula is commonly called the shoulder blade. So you can see this is a flat bone, and it's also irregularly shaped. And I would probably say that the clavicle falls along the lines of a long bone, but it's also irregularly shaped. So the clavicle or collarbone is S-shaped, and here we see it in the anterior uh, view in figure 8.2 on page 244. So the medial and articulates with the manubrium of the sternum and the lateral acromial and articulates with the acromion of the scapula. Here is figure 8.3 on page 245. The scapula is a flat bone that is located in the superior part of the posterior thorax between the second and seventh ribs. Its glenoid cavity is the attachment point for the humerus. So you can see the glenoid cavity right here, which is this, this depression that accepts the proximal end of the humerus, which if you've ever had a dislocated shoulder, well, that means that the humerus is going to pop out of this little glenoid cavity that you have. Here. So that's how those two bones articulate. The upper limb, the humerus, or the arm bone, articulates with the scapula proximally, and its rounded head fits into the glenoid cavity. We just said that. It also articulates with the radius and the ulna distally. The trochlea articulates with the ulna and the capitulum uh, with the radius. Figure 8.4 on page 246. So you can kind of see what it's talking about there. Let's go back. Uh, so the scapula is proximal, which means that it's closer to the center of the body, and its head fits in the glenoid cavity. So we see that here, and we already talked about that when we were talking about the scapula. Or on the other end of the bone, we've got the radius and the ulna, which you can see here is the radius, and here is the ulna. And so you've got the capitulum here, the trochlea is going to articulate with the ulna, and the capitulum is going to articulate with the radius. So the ulna and the radius are the two bones of the forearm. The ocranon and the coronoid process at the proximal end of the ulna from the trochlear notch, which wraps around the trochlea of the humerus, making up the elbow joint. The radius is located on the lateral thumb side of the forearm, the articulation of its head with the capitulum of the humerus and with the ulna allow the forearm to rotate. See how it articulates. So remember in anatomical position, your palms are going to be up facing anterior. Thumb side, this is going to be the radius. And then on the pinky side, um, you've got the ulna. And this is figure 8.5 on page 248. So yeah, so you can see here the anterior view, which is the palm up here is on the left. And then notice the radius at that point is towards the outside or on the same side as the thumb. doesn't matter if it's the left or the right hand. The radius is going to be on the same side of the thumb in both cases. And then the ulna is going to be lateral to that, more medial, I guess you would call it if we we're talking in anatomical terms. Oh yeah, the other thing I wanted to point out here was the introsiosis membrane, which is this membrane that fills the space in between the radius and the ulna. So that's important to know too, that there's like a fibrous membrane that bonds those two bones together. And here you see in more detail figure 8.6 
how the radius and the ulna are going to articulate with the humerus. So here's the, the radius, and the radius articulates with the capitulum, and then the ulna is going to articulate with the trochlea. And then, of course, this bone is the humerus, so you can kind of see this makes up the elbow. And we're, we'll be uh, talking about the joints on the next chapter. I actually like this view. If, this, if we remove the humerus and we're just looking down at those two bones in the forearm there, that's a really good view of it. You can kind of see how they're going to articulate with the humerus and then how they're close together as well, but they're not exactly touching. And I'm sure there's some kind of ligament or some kind of tissue in between those two. So moving on to the, the carpal bones. Carpal bones are eight small bones connected to each other by ligaments, and they are arranged in two rows of four bones each. The proximal row, which is the row that's closer to the shoulder, it's the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetrium, and the pisiform, and they articulate with the distal radius and ulna. So this is the proximal location of the radius and ulna, and this is the distal end of it. We were talking about the bones of the wrist now, the carpal bones. And then the distal row, so there's going to be two rows. So there's four bones here first, and then there's another four bones that are more distal, and that's the trapezium, the trapezoid, the capitate, and the hamate, and they articulate with the metacarpals, which are the bones that are going to lead to the fingers. And we have a slide on that here in a few minutes, but we have five metacarpals that make up the palm and the back of the hand. They're numbered one through five, starting with the thumb. One, two, three, four, five. The bases articulate with the distal carpals, while their heads articulate with the proximal phalanges. And the phalanges are, it's just a fancy word for fingers. The phalanges are the bones of the digits. You have 14 total. The thumb contains two, proximal and distal, while the other four fingers contain three. It's proximal, middle, and distal. So your fingertip is distal. And then you can see that here on page 250 at figure 8.7. And the book gives you a mnemonic to help remember those bone names. Stop letting those people touch the cadaver's hand. Okay, well, if, if you can remember that, then yeah, go ahead. But it might be easier just to remember the names of the, of the actual bones. I guess the mnemonic can help you remember the first letter of the bones. See here, we've got the the hands here, and so you can see the carpals here in red, and then you've got your metacarpals here in yellow, and then your phalanges are in this like grayish blue color. And then, of course, this is going to be distal, and this is going to be proximal. There's four bones here that are more proximal, and these four bones are more distal. These metacarpals are distal yet, but they're proximal compared to the phalanges. And then also remember, if we were going to number our phalanges or our metacarpals, we would number them from the thumb to the pinky. So let's talk about the pelvis. And you can see this at figure 8.8 .8 on page 251. But the pelvis is what makes up your hips and what articulates your lower appendages or your legs uh, to the axial skeleton. And you can see all the different parts of the pelvis in this figure. Uh, however, the coccyx and the sacrum, yeah, it's the sacrum. So remember the, the sacrum and the coccyx, they're part of the axial skeleton. Uh, they're part of the spinal cord. Remember the coccyx is the tailbone, so the sacrum just kind of fits right in there in between the two hip bones. And you got this sacroiliac joint that articulates those three bones together, or I should uh, two bones, depending on how you're thinking of it. Uh, these two bones here, it's hard to see the coccyx in this view, but we have another view where it'll turn the view to the side and you'll be able to see the coccyx more clearly. But for right now, you can see that the, this part in this figure is just in the wider, the, the off-white, which represents the axial skeleton. And then this is the part that we're 
trying to illustrate here the hip girdle or the pelvic girdle. So the pelvic girdle is made up of two hip bones, the coxa and the coxal bones, that articulate with the sacrum posteriorly. Each hip bone is actually made up of three individual bones, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. The two bones articulate anteriorly at the pubic bones. That makes up the pubic symphysis. And there is a disc of fibrocartilage between the two bones. So this is figure 8.9 on page 252. And we can see the ilium is going to be superior to the ischium and the pubis. So we're looking at a lateral view, which means that we're looking at it from the side. And then this part here is actually a medial view. So this would be like if we took a medial cross section and we were viewing it from the side that we cut. You see the little pores in there. So that's like it's been cut away. So you can see there that in this case, the pubis is going to be uh, the anterior portion of that, your pubic area, so that would make sense. And then this ischium is going to be posterior to that. And, of course, they're both inferior to the ilium. The head of the femur articulates with the acetabulum of the hip bone as a ball and socket joint. The acetabulum is composed of parts of all three of the bones that make up the hip bone. The pelvis is divided into a superior and inferior portion by the pelvic brim, which is where the abdomen meets the pelvic cavity. So let's see here. This is figure 8.10 on page 254. So you can see here's your, your hip bone and, of course, your sacrum. We've already defined that. And this is your pelvic inlet. And this is going to be important. And this is an, a place where... The male and the female skeletons are going to be different. Now, of course, you know, males have more bone mass than females do on average. But for the most part, males are, on average, larger than females. So there's that difference. But when we get into this part, this bone, there's some differences between the two sexes that we're going to go through here in a few minutes. But we need to set up the stage a little bit before we start talking about those differences. So let's get to know the pelvis a little bit better. Now, here's a, the lateral view I was telling you about before. And here's, so here's going to be your sacrum. Right? So this is your spinal column right here. And here's your sacrum. And here's your coccyx. So you can kind of see how the tailbone curves around like that. And then you're going to see this thing called the greater pelvis and the lesser pelvis. So the lesser pelvis is known as the true pelvis and the greater pelvis is known as the false pelvis. The area of the bony pelvis superior to the pelvic brim is known as the false pelvis. The area of the bony pelvis inferior to the pelvic brim is known as the true pelvis and I just defined that. And here's another important point that I want to point out. This plane of pelvic outlet is going to be important, as we'll see when we start talking about the differences between the sexes. But this thing I wanted to point out is this pelvic axis. And this is another thing that's an important difference between the two sexes. All right, so let's delve into that a little bit more. This is a continuation of figure 8.10, but this moves on to page 255. So here's the anterior superior view of the greater pelvis. So this would be the false pelvis here. And then here's our true pelvis, or our lesser pelvis. So this is just looking at it from the front, and it's, it's kind of rotated a little bit. So you're kind of looking more down at it instead of uh, looking at it straight on. That's what it means by superior. So the male and female pelvis, and that's pelvis is the word that you use if you're talking about pelvis in the plural form. Pelvis is singular, pelvis is plural. So the male and female pelvis differ in several ways. The bones of the male pelvis are usually larger and heavier. Yes, we already defined that several slides ago, and we've defined that when we first started talking about the skeletal system. We made the point that, you know, on average, uh, just because of the way that men are, that their bones are in generally heavier and larger. However, the bones of the female pelvis are structured to meet the requirements of pregnancy and childbirth. So the female pelvis is wider and shallower than that of a male. Let's have a closer look. 
So here is table 8.1, and this starts on page 256. So this is going to give us a nice comparison of the male and female pelvis. All right, so the general structure is light and thin, and then the male is, of course, heavy and thick. The greater pelvis on a female is shallow, where the greater pelvis on the male is deep. And the pelvic inlet is more wide and oval. This is an important difference here because this allows the female to bear children, where the male is going to be narrower, and they call it heart-shaped. But you can certainly tell by this pelvic inlet the differences here. And that's another reason that males, like at their hips, are usually more straight, where females, they have that curve there. And there's also evolutionary reasons for that curve. And if you've ever read Charles Darwin, The Origin of Species, or The Descent of Man, uh, those are two good books you should read. And that goes into great detail of why, philosophically, why the female is shaped that way versus this anatomical reason or physio it, this could even be a physiological reason because the idea of giving birth to a child and needing a shallower and, and wider pelvis uh, that's certainly like an anatomy structure so a physiology's function so that's certainly a function of that it's definitely i would call it a utility of that the other thing is i want to point out is this uh, pubic arch so you can tell that this is wider in the female than it is in the male. Also, another fun fact about the female is that if you were to put a chair against a wall, and if you bend over and put your head against the wall, and then if you try to pick up a chair, uh, the, the females can do it, but the men can't. And that's because their center of gravity is different. So because the female has this little uh, shallower pelvis, it actually changes her center of gravity. Moving on, uh, table 8.1. So we can kind of see here that we're looking at lateral views of the pelvis uh, in the male and the female. So you can see the iliac crest is less curved in the female, but more curved in the male. And see how her sacrum is going out a little bit and then the male, where his is more kind of a straight here. And then look at the differences here in the greater sciatic notch. See how wide the female is? And even in this depression, you can also see that the female seems like it's a little bit more forward, don't it? And she seems like she's got a little more width here to the bone than the male does. Okay, well, let's talk about this slide real quick. So we see the pelvic outlet is wider and, and it's narrower in the male. I mean, this isn't like to scale or anything, right? But it's got a tape measure. I can uh, say that, according to the book, that's about an inch and a half. And according to my computer screen, inch and 15 sixteenths. So you can see there, if this is a scale, that's a pretty, pretty good size difference. Let's talk about this pelvic axis. So this is important because this axis or this degree, this space in here is the birth canal. So that's important. And then the doctors, you know, when you become pregnant, they will actually do some metrics on that. They'll look at your, either with the sonogram or doing it with, well, I don't think they'd be as crude as using a tape measure, but they probably have some instrument for measuring that. But what they'll do there is they'll make a determination of whether the baby's head is actually going to be able to fit. Now, sure, there, during pregnancy, there is some dilation there, but still you're constrained by that bone. So if the baby's head is just not going to fit through that bone, and sure, when the baby's born, a natural childbirth like that, it does shape the head a little bit. Because remember, at that point, your skull is, you've got the fontanelles in there, so your skull is a little bit malleable at that point in your life. Doctors need to make sure that the baby will actually fit through the bone, and if it doesn't, then they will recommend to you a C-section. And the other thing I wanted to mention about the pelvis, much like your, your rib cage is going to protect your internal organs, like your heart and your lungs, etc., your pelvic protects your reproductive organs. The female reproductive organs are, are all located within this area. And of course, for the male, his sex organs are located outside of the body, but the prostate and your bladder is also protected in here. The vagina is internal and it goes into the pelvis. 
and then her other sex organs are all located within the pelvis region and that helps to give them some protection. Okay, so we talked about the pelvis and then now we're going to move on to the lower limbs. So the femur is the longest, heaviest, and strongest bone in the body. The proximal end inserts into the acetabulum of the hip bone. The distal end articulates with the tibia and the patella. So we can see here figure 8.11 on page 258. So here's the femur, and it's definitely a long bone. And you can see here's the patella, which is also commonly called the kneecap. Here's the head of the femur articulating with the acetabulum of the pelvis. And then you can also see here the femur articulating with the tibia. So the patella is a triangular bone that develops in, in the quadriceps tendon. Its posterior surface articulates with the femur. So yeah, so that's an interesting thing about the patella. It, it articulates with the femur, but that's the only bone that it articulates with. So the kneecap's just kind of floating out there in a tendon, and it's held in place that way. So this is 8.12 on page 259. Uh, I can't say it's any clearer in the book than it is in here, but it looks like it might articulate with the tibia, but it doesn't. So that's an important thing to remember about that. So the lower leg consists of the tibia and the fibula. The tibia's proximal end articulates with the femur. Tibia's distal end articulates with the talus of the ankle. And the tibial tuberosity on the anterior surface is the point of attachment for the patellar ligament. So there's a ligament that's going to connect the patella to the tibia. Tibia and the patella don't actually articulate with one another, but there is a ligament that's going to facilitate their relationship. Page 260, figure 8.13. It looks very similar to the forearm, doesn't it? Your tibia, which is you would probably commonly call your shin bone, and then behind here is the fibula. But of course, I guess one of the major differences between the fibula and the tibia relationship compared to the radius and the ulna relationship is that the fibula does not articulate with the femur, where the radius and the ulna both articulate with the humerus. So I guess I'm, I'm drawing an analogy to the femur and the humerus to the radius and the ulna in contrast to the tibia and the fibula. And you can see that there's also another one of those interosseous membranes in between the tibia and the fibula, like there is in the radius and the ulna relationship. So that gives you a pretty good clear view of the uh, lower part of the leg, anterior and posterior. So let's see, let's go on. And then that brings us to page 261. This is still figure 8.13. But you can see the tibia and this fibular notch, which is right here. So this view means that this is what we're looking at. So you can see how there's a little notch that allows the fibula to articulate with the tibia at this distal end of the two bones. The tarsus contains seven tarsal bones. These are the talus, the cocanus, the navicular. You have three cuneiforms, and then you have the cuboid. Let's go through this slide. The metatarsus is made up of five metatarsal bones, just like the metacarpals. So remember, these are the metacarpals right here. These bones uh, uh, lead from the wrist to your fingers. So in another analogy or another contrast, the metatarsals are going to lead from your ankle bones to your toes. They are numbered one through five, starting with the big toe. So your book is basically equating the big toe to the thumb. One, two, three, four, five, just numbered from the big toe out, numbered from the thumb out. They make up the sole and the dorsal surface of the foot. The proximal ends articulate with three cuneiform bones and the cuboid. The distal ends articulate with the proximal phalanges. Oh, let's see what's on the next slide. The phalanges are arranged exactly like those of the hand. The big toe has a proximal and a distal phalanx, and the other toes have a proximal, middle, and distal phalanx. Let's look at the figure, 8.14 on page 262. 
So this gives you a clear view of the foot. And so you see here big toe, one, two, three, four, five, little toe, pinky toe, whatever you want to call it. Much like your thumb has only one joint. And then your, your other fingers have the two joints. So it's the same thing with your toes. The toes and the fingers, they're very analogous of one another. Um, you can see here the cuboid pretty clearly, and that's a pretty good-sized uh, ankle bone there. So you can see all the an ankle bones and how they're articulating with the metatarsals. And then it gives you another mnemonic. Tall centers never take shots from corners. Well, this must be talking about basketball, and I would imagine there's probably a few centers that would take a shot from a corner. I'm pretty sure that Shaq took shots from the corner. So I don't know if this is true. It's just the idea mainly is to give you an idea of how you can remember these. For instance, if you were on a timed quiz or exam and you were asked names of the metacarpals or the metatarsals, and if you knew this mnemonic and you could remember that first letter, for each one of these big words that you have to know, then maybe that would help you get through your quiz or exam faster. Or if you're working in the medical profession and maybe you're working for a podiatrist, it might help you to remember that. But probably if you're working it with it on a daily basis, you probably don't need a mnemonic. Anyway, the foot has two arches that are supported by ligaments and tendons. The purpose of the arches is to allow the foot to support the weight of the body, provide leverage while walking, and distribute the body's weight over the foot. The two arches are the longitudinal arch, which is made up of the medial and lateral portion, and the transverse arch. So let's have a look at figure 8.15 on page 263. So you can see here is the transverse arch how it goes across the foot laterally and then you've got this longitudinal arch and then you've got a lateral one and a medial one which just means that it's both basically the same arch but one part of it's more medial one part of it's more lateral and then of course it puts it in the context so here's your fibula and then of course your cuboid and your phalanges which are the toes metatarsals, so you can put that in the context. And this is actually a very good diagram of it. And I've always been interested in the arches of the foot. I learned a long time ago, just to give you a little bit of my personal knowledge, I don't like to buy cheap shoes. I don't mind spending a little bit of money on shoes. I want to get a, a pair of shoes with a good arch support in them. Uh, I found that when I buy, and I'm not uh, endorsing any kind of shoe, I just know a lot of times you get what you pay for. And if you're buying cheap shoes for 20 bucks, or I could buy $75 shoes, what's the difference? I mean, they're just shoes right now. There, there is a difference because most likely the $75 ones hopefully are made better. You're not just paying for a brand name. You're paying for quality, a good quality shoe. And I found two things when I, when I was younger and I was trying to save money. I buy a $20 pair of shoes. I mean, I'd, I'd go through the shoes in like a couple months. And then my foot, my feet always hurt. And then I, so I thought, well, I took a chance one day and I tried a more expensive and I, I won't ever go back. It's just, they give you good arch support. My feet no longer hurt and they last significantly longer than the other kind. So yeah, don't just buy a brand name. If you're buying just for a brand name, you might not get what you expect, but if you're buying for a good quality arch support and a good shoe that's uh, constructed well, uh, that can help your feet to feel better. It can help your posture. It can help you through your work day. Uh, there's a lot of good things to be said about having a, a good pair of shoes. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the development of the skeletal system. So most skeletal tissues arise from the middle primary germ layer in the embryos known as the mesoderm, although most of the skull arises from the outer layer called the ectoderm. So if you recall back from, I don't remember, it was chapter one or chapter four maybe, the fetus, the ectoderm is going to develop in the nervous tissue. And then the mesoderm is going to develop into like the blood vessels and the blood and things like that. The skull bones, interestingly enough, are developing from this ectoderm. And it makes total sense, right? Because uh, the nervous tissue is developed from the ectoderm. So wouldn't it make sense because the skull's protecting the brain inside there. And 
Uh, furthermore, uh, the spine is protecting the nervous tissue as well. So that's not, when I read this slide, it's not surprising to me. So it talks about the skull bones developing in two ways. The cartilaginous neurocranium, which is hyaline cartilage, undergoes endochondral ossification. And ossification just means that it turns into bone. Membranous neurocranium undergoes intermembranous ossification. The bones of the face form from the visceral cranium. This is divided into two parts. The cartilaginous visceral cranium comes from the cartilage of the pharyngeal arches, and this forms the ear bones and the hyoid bone. Hmm, so that's interesting. Because remember, the hyoid bone doesn't really articulate with anything, and the ear bones are the smallest and densest bones in the body. And remember, the axial skeleton, they said that technically the ear bones aren't really part of the axial skeleton. But I, they're, they're in the skull, so it seems like they should be. Anyway, the membranous visceral cranium comes from the mesenchyme of the pharyngeal arch, undergoes intramembranous ossification, and forms the facial bones. So here we get figure 8.16. And this is showing us here the development of the skull. So you can see here's the frontal bone, which this one is going to migrate out here. And here's your ear bones, the stapes, the incus, and the malleus. Here's your occipital, which is going to come out here. And then you've got two parietals that will be here on either side of the skull. The skeleton of the limb girdles and the limbs is derived from the mesoderm. Between week four and week eight after fertilization, there is an extensive amount of growth and development in the formation of the upper and lower limbs. This must still be part of figure 8.16, but now we're moving over to page 265. So here we see at about four weeks, we start to form these upper limb buds and the lower limb bud. It's still kind of hard to make out a face here, but it looks like we've got a lens that's starting to form in a future ear. So this is pretty embryonic, and this is obviously going to be the final cord. So here we see at about six weeks, the hand is starting to become more defined as well as the foot. Our eye, so you remember as we develop the eye, we're developing those orbitals too, and those parts of the face and the skull are going to be developing as well. And here's those pharyngeal arches that, that we were talking about on the previous slide. Continuing on, you can see more development of the ear after seven weeks. The eye is actually starting to look like an eye now still kind of kind of embryonic in its appearance. You can see this little furrow. Well, that's going to go away after about another week. And it starts to look more and more like a person. Look at your umbilical cord. According to this cartoon, the hands and the feet look an awful lot alike at this point, don't they? Like so here would be the knee. Here's the elbow. Yeah, but my, my point is, is that if you look at these, they look very similar at this point. And I was drawing those analogies earlier, comparing the metacarpals to the metatarsals and how they articulate with the bones of the wrist or the bones of the ankle and then the bones of the finger or the bones of the toe. The skeletal system is also important for homeostasis, and we've been talking about that for the whole semester. Homeostasis is a recurring theme throughout this book. We will be talking about it in every chapter and in the previous chapters we've done on the skeletal system so far, which this is our third chapter on the skeletal system. Uh, we've discussed homeostasis and the important role it plays, but skeletal system plays an important role in the homeostasis of every body system. Both directly and indirectly, the skeletal system ensures the proper functioning of these systems. Go to page 266 and then it gives you each system and what important relationship the skeletal system plays to those systems. So uh, please read through this on your own time. And that's the end of the slides.